you put Wi-Fi in schools, what you're saying is, for the sake of a little bit of money that saves getting a workman in to drill holes through the walls to, to feed cable, because it's cheaper, we're just going to put Wi-Fi in, but you can have genetically damaged children for the rest of your family's career. That's what we're saying. All smartphones come with some information that basically says, don't keep the phone in your pocket. And there's a tremendous amount of sponsored research by people who are hired to do studies to find no effect. It's not a matter of war. It's a matter of the future. Do you really want to have to prove that there's a significant increased risk of brain cancer before taking steps to reduce exposures to prevent that harm from happening? There are now more than six billion cell phones in the world today, eight billion wireless transmitting devices, more than 50 billion are anticipated to form the Internet of Things, and we have to recognize that we don't know a lot about the public health and environmental effects of this form of radiation. The microwave oven actually happens to be of the same frequency as the cell phone, the mobile phone. A mobile phone and the microwave oven use a very similar frequency. The difference between them is power. The power of the microwave oven is a thousand watts. And of course, that's power that can heat up a cup of water in maybe 60 seconds. The microwave oven, the mobile phone, the cordless phone, the Wi-Fi monitor, the baby monitor, they all use the same frequency. They differ in power. They also differ because mobile phones and Wi-Fi devices emit pulsed microwave radiation. It's the pulse, not the power, that appears to be biologically most important. The pulse that is erratic and irregular, like for thousands of minutes a month for dozens of hours a week, over a lifetime, that irregular pulsed signal may be much more biologically important. This is just to show you what happens in a four second mobile phone call. This is power density, power density indicated here. And of course, a phone is on standby, it's not doing too much, but 900 times a minute, it's looking to, for a signal, it says to the tower, where are you? Here I am. Where are you? Here I am. It's smart. That's how it's supposed to do. Now, when the phone rings, the worst time for you to put a phone right next to your head is when you answer it and say hello. Because it's smart and it goes to max power. They're programmed to do that. Max power. Now, it's going to go to max power. You're going to listen and then it will go up and down and up and down. And again, it's that variation. It's the delta. It's the cumulative integrative dose under the curve over a lifetime of exposure that looks to be biologically important. Here showing you that a smaller adult head here, you see the amount of exposure is, is quite similar, but because the head is smaller, it will absorb proportionally more. And here is what it looks like after a period of six minutes. And that's really not as bad as it might look because you see the red area only gets partway through the eye of the adult, right? The one that we're really concerned about is this one with the young child. And this is a three-year-old brain that we modeled. And you see that by the end of that six-minute call, uh, the peak radiation, yellow and red, is, is, is getting all the way into almost both eyes. And this is a modeled microwave radiation dose of a six-year-old with greater levels to the frontal and temporal lobes, eyes and cheek. And watch this here. Now, yellow, white, and red are the hottest, all right? And if you look carefully, you will see it's going into the eye, the nose. We'll do it again, just so you'll get to see it. And partly into the brain stem. The United States magazine Consumer Reports recently recommended that nobody keep a phone in their pocket. Nobody. 
And that has to do with exposure to the reproductive organs. We call them the gonads. I think you say the testicles and bone marrow. And look here at the radiation as it gets into the groin area. And that's just from having a mobile phone modeled into the pocket. And this is a measure of vitality. We measure how well the sperm swim. This is a measure of mo mobility, motility. This is a measure of mitochondrial DNA damage. They have three times as much damage on their DNA if they have been exposed to mobile phone radiation as compared to controls. This is the data from the Cleveland Clinic showing that men who keep cell phones in their pockets the longest have the lowest sperm count. And again, there are many other studies with similar results. But when it comes to issues like this, there really is not much to debate. And it's interesting that the research on this issue comes from people who are expert in male fertility, who started to treat men at infertility clinics and noticed that this was a major contributor to their fertility problems. This is just to show you, uh, this is a normal testis. You see the boundaries, the cell wall, it looks very nice. And this is after microwave radiation exposure. Now, when it comes to pregnancy, we're working with Yale University and uh, more than 100 physicians and experts in the United States and around the world who are specialists in pregnancy. And we have been modeling exposure to the head at the end of pregnancy. And at the end of pregnancy, when of course the head, as any woman here knows, is right at the surface, um, if you're lucky it's at the surface and it's not facing the spine, then you can get the greatest exposure because of course the skin is completely permeable to this radiation exposure. And this article was published in Brain Research, which is a relatively high impact journal. And what they showed was that prenatally exposed newborns have basically fewer cells in the hippocampus. Here's the exposed, missing some cells. And here are the controls, which they're compared with. And you can see here that these cells are, um, there's more of them. Here they're more scattered. And those results show lower testosterone, which is a very important hormone for a male. Men and women both have testosterone. Men just need a lot more of it. And also increases of DNA damage as measured by certain enzymes. And the, and the offspring had lower fertility. Now, the breast. The breast is mostly fat, contains a lot of fluid. Things that contain flat and fluid cook faster in the microwave oven. Now, a cell phone can't cook anything, all right? Mobile phones do not pop popcorn. That was a fraud. They don't make any heat that we know of, otherwise they wouldn't be permitted. But they do go through things that contain fat and fluid. And here I want to show you our first case report from 2009, and we now have many more. This was a Chinese-American woman a Chinese-American woman who used her cell phone four hours a day in her bra for 10 years while she was driving. Now, and you drive with a, with a phone on your body. The phone is smart. It's going to go from one tower to another, and it's going to say, here I am, where are you, here I am. And it's going to be going to max power each time it moves from one cell tower to another. And there it was right next to her chest. And the tumors that developed, developed right under the antenna of the phone. Unusual tumors. And now we have 38 of them. Not a single one of them has a family history. None of them has inherited the defects that we know increase the risk of breast cancer. Uh, they have multifocal tumors. That means they have more than one tumor and the tumors are located under the antenna, sometimes just right in the center of the chest. My colleagues at Yale University have taken mice, exposed them to mobile phone radiation, and they have found significant effects on those mice's behavior as adults, all right? Prenatally exposed mice have hyperactivity as adults. And these are some of the data. They have worse memory, they're more hyperactive, they have more anxiety, but they don't have much fear. It's kind of interesting. And interestingly, 
if people started to use phones regularly before age 20, as most of the world is doing now, there was four to eight times more brain cancer after they reached, uh, had passed 10 years. So now, why is there no increase in brain cancer that we can find in the general population today? Because there is not. And after all, if mobile phones really are important, why don't we have an epidemic today? Well, let me tell you why. First of all, brain cancer takes a long time to develop. How do we know that? We know that because when the bombs fell at the end of World War II, there was no increase in brain cancer in the survivors who had been studied. No increase at all. Until 40 years had passed. It took 40 years for an increase in brain cancer to show up in that highly exposed population. Now think about this. Today, the number of people using cell phones today and using them heavily today is very different than it was even five years ago, even three years ago. Now you're being encouraged to have unlimited talk and text, right? You didn't have unlimited talk and text five years ago or 10 years ago. So the uses and the users of phones are changing radically. In fact, most epidemiologic studies find no increased risk of brain cancer from mobile phone radiation. They don't. <clears throat> Until 10 years of heavy use. And by the way, the way they define a cell phone user in these studies, I'm not making this up, is somebody who makes one call a week for six months. Yes, that's the, that was the, yes. One call a week for six months. That was the definition in these studies, which, by the way, don't find any increase. All right? So I'm not saying this to say that they did a bad job. I'm saying that we are challenged here with how do you do a study of something that's rapidly changing while you're studying it. Ten minutes of mobile phone radiation daily for ten days, worker bees did not return to test colonies. And this would be something that could easily be replicated. Sponsored research, this is to put it politely, can induce publication bias. Uh, another way to say this is that where you stand on an issue depends on where you sit and who's bought your chair. And there's a tremendous amount of sponsored research by people who are hired to do studies to find no effect. And that's plagued this field in a number of countries, including within the government itself. Including within the government itself. In the United States today, the gentleman who is directing the Federal Communications Commission, Tom Wheeler, was for 10 years the executive director of the Cell Phone Telecommunications Industry Association. And now he's in charge of regulating those devices. So it's challenging to have a neutral playing field under that circumstance. It's not simple. There are real complexities to this field. Unfortunately, <clears throat> at least in the past, industry had a very clear strategy. And in my book, Disconnect, I document and quote in the new afterword in, that in 1994, when industry first became aware that there were studies suggesting that mobile phone radiation could damage brain cells of rats, a memo was written to, quote, war hyphen game the science. War game the science. This issue is far too important to be gamed. It's not a matter of war. It's a matter of the future health of your children and grandchildren. Do you really want to have to prove that there's a significant increased risk of brain cancer before taking steps to reduce exposures to prevent that harm from happening? That's really the question. How much evidence do we need before taking precautionary steps? And that's what brings me back to my days at the National Academy of Sciences when we seriously looked at the evidence on passive smoke and airplane travel. We only finally took steps to act when it became clear that children of smokers were hospitalized more often. That was the evidence that, that we had to have.
Now, why children are specifically at risk, and I'm going to deal, please forgive me for that, I'm going to deal at length with Wi-Fi. This is my main concern. There are five reasons why children are most at risk. <clears throat> First of all, I'll just have a drink of you, forgive me. I'm doing well today. Some, sometimes I can't get through that bit. Uh, there is no known safety level of microwave irradiation anywhere in the world published for a child. And whenever I go to a country, I make a challenge, and I'm making it here. I will face any government scientist, any industry scientist, live on television, and I will say to them, what is the safe level of microwave irradiation for a child? And when I speak in schools and to governments and royalty and other people I talk to, I say, what is the safe level? Because if you can't tell me, why are you putting Wi-Fi in schools? A single day of a child in front of Wi-Fi in a school is a day too long. And I will come to why in a second. Now, with children, there is no known safe level anywhere published in the world. <clears throat> Would you give a drug to a child if there was no known safe level? Would you guess? No, of course you wouldn't. In children, the blood-brain barrier, which is a barrier around the brain, it also, is also around the thorax, the chest, and it also covers a part of the gut. <clears throat> it's like a, a fishing net. And in children, it takes 18 months to develop from birth. It is published and it is known that microwaves destroy the blood-brain barrier. Now, what that means is that as the child is in the womb and as the child is growing up, toxins from inside the body can go into the brain and cause damage and essential chemicals inside the brain can come out and deprive the brain of what it needs. Now, uh, Dr. Christine Ackerman, I believe, think she's German, she will forgive me if she isn't, and another doctor have written on this extensively, and they have both said this can lead to autism and other neurological illnesses in children. <clears throat> the nervous system inside a child, uh, the electrical cables, if you like, they have 122 layers to protect them from neurological damage. And they take 22 years to complete. A child doesn't have the full system until the child is 22 years old. They are laid down by a system known as protein synthesis. And protein synthesis is destroyed by microwave irradiation. You are risking neural degenerative damage with your children with Wi-Fi in a classroom. And I can assure you, as true as I stand here, the levels of radiation in a classroom exceed those that are used in the Cold War to make people sick. <clears throat> and if you add up the radiation a child is exposed to in a class of 20 or 30 transmitters, with one on the wall, with one in the playground, taking all of the calls from all the other classrooms and spreading around the school, um, when you add that up, it's pretty frightening. <clears throat> the immune system of a child <clears throat> takes 18 years to complete. And at the beginning, that document from the American government, everything it comes up with is suppression of the immune system. 
So you are destroying a child's immune system again before it's up and running. <clears throat> and of course, I have documentary evidence for all this. Uh, and finally, the bones. The bones in a child are not fully developed until the child is 28. Now, if a child goes to school at five and stays there at university until 24, and they use Wi-Fi, that's a lot of bone damage. And there are papers to show that both the marrow in the bones, which is, of course, moist, <coughs> uh, which makes the immune system, and the bone density, uh, they can be affected. Uh, but it takes 28 years. And if anybody's wondering what the last bone is to form, it's the clavicle. The clavicle here. <clears throat> and this is the paper here. I carry all of my evidence with me. Here it is, protein synth synthesis uh, by the University of Dundee, Scottish University, very clever people. Uh, protein synthesis. <clears throat> now, the reason there is no safe level for a child is that, and this appeared in a scientific journal, August 2012, they have just suddenly realized what we have been saying all along. <coughs> Children are not small adults. You don't look at an adult dose and scale it down for a child. That is wrong. They are immensely complex beings. Immensely complex. And you cannot scale. This is to do for the drugs industry. Uh, this is a warning for the drugs industry that where they're putting adult dose, child dose, the child dose is wrong. It is a guess. But for microwave, there is no child safe level anyway. And children absorb, as it happens, more radiation than adults because they're smaller. And the smaller you are, you, the more you are to the size of the aerial and the more you will resonate with the microwaves. <coughs> if there is any doubt, there are 17 pages here of university published papers explaining how fertility and reproductive organs in ladies are damaged by microwaves. 17 pages of just university experiments. So there can be no doubt. <clears throat> and I can never believe for the life of me why people put Wi-Fi in schools. I can never understand it. Well, I can understand it. Usually, uh, they give them some sort of gift, like a free phone or a free iPad or iPod. They, because it's cheaper <coughs> to do that, than it is use fiber optic cable and telephone cables. It's cheaper. Uh, so they do that. <coughs> this is, uh, I, I've been through this. Again, the small print, the small print in the mobile phone book at the back. Uh, I've read a few of them, but it particularly warns here. Uh, I'm not sure how you measure this, but it says, uh, 9.8 inches, keep it 9.8 inches from your body, especially pregnant women and the lower abdomen of teenagers. How you would measure that, I, I don't know. I, I summed up, I summed up uh, quite a few hundred research papers I'm here with disturbing news about our favorite gadgets, cell phones, tablets, Wi-Fi, etc. Putting it bluntly, they are damaging the living cells in our bodies and killing many of us prematurely. I'm Dr. Martin Blank from the Department of Physiology and Cellular Biophysics at Columbia University. It is distressing for me and more than 160 colleagues who today are petitioning the United Nations requesting that they address this problem. We are scientists and engineers, and I am here to tell you 
we have created something that is harming us, and it is getting out of control. Before Edison's light bulb, there was very little electromagnetic radiation in our environment. The levels today are very many times higher than natural background levels and are growing rapidly because of all the new devices that emit this radiation. An example that a lot of us have in our pockets right now is the cell phone. One study shows that as cell phone usage has spread widely, the incidence of fatal brain cancer in younger people has more than tripled. We are putting cellular antennas on residential buildings and on top of hospitals where people are trying to get well. Wireless utility meters and cell towers are blanketing our neighborhoods with radiation. It's particularly frightening that radiation from our telecommunication and power line technology is damaging the DNA in our cells. It is clear to many biologists that this can account for the rising cancer rates. Future generations, our children, are at risk. These biologists and scientists are not being heard on the committees that set safety standards. The biological facts are being ignored, and as a result, the safety limits are much too high. They are not protective. More protection will probably result from full disclosure of possible conflicts of interest between regulators and industry. Rising exposure to electromagnetic radiation is a global problem. The World Health Organization and international standard-setting bodies are not acting to protect the public's health and well-being. International exposure guidelines for electromagnetic fields must be strengthened to reflect the reality of their impact on our bodies, and in particular, on our DNA. Although we are still in the midst of a great technological transformation, the time to deal with the harmful biological and health effects is long overdue. We are really all part of a large biological experiment without our informed consent. To protect our children, ourselves, and our ecosystem, we must reduce exposure by establishing more protective guidelines. And so today, scientists from around the world are submitting an appeal to the United Nations, its member states, and the World Health Organization to provide leadership in dealing with this emerging public health crisis.